I'm Malcolm Van Delst, and this is a continuation of the Low Self-Esteem Reading Room, aka Loser, a deliberately non-linear genre-defying text that explores feminine gatherer as opposed to hunter, holistic as opposed to specialized and goal-oriented life experience. From the foreword, if you have nothing to lose, but also nothing to gain because you will never matter, your life becomes open for experimentation. You could write, sing, act, draw, dance, knowing none of it matters. In doing so, you realize that achievement is chimera. The women, slaves, and exploited, these people are never counted among heroes. Yet without them, the heroes don't exist. Heroes are thieves. Don't be a hero. Last week, Jess and Naomi were shaken to see into each other's worlds from a portal. And in Kara's book, Piss, Alien, and Friends, an immigrant mother talked about the need to ration everything, love included, while her daughter talked about her mother's inability to trust anyone. We're continuing with Kara's book. One, two, three. One. Jesus fucking Christ. This is like the fifth time I've written this goddamn story. It's not even a story. It's fucking true. But I want to write fiction, so I'm trying to fictionalize it because I'm fucking stupid and not happy with who I am. I'm working so hard at being who I am, but I can't be who I am. I'm afraid I'll lose all my friends and income. Seriously. That's because my friends and income are intertwined. I'm a woman. My husband is my income and my best friend. If it isn't Stockholm Syndrome or giving up any semblance of a happy, warm, people-filled life, oh, that's right. We're together because I had given up any semblance of a people-filled life. My idea of a happy life when I met him was one that involved as few people as possible. Throw out the baby with the bath water. <laughs> That's me. I now have that life without people, and I'm lonely. But I was lonely before, too. I'm not lonely when I'm dancing, nor when I'm here writing. Two. Okay, back to the beginning. Here's the first draft of this godforsaken story. So my grade 12 teacher tells me to write, like, not for fun, but a career. I had to believe it, not believing you're full of shit, Mr. Sexton. To not believe was to disrespect someone who loved me. I couldn't do that. I actually had no instincts around love. I put the movements on my body. Do you have a smoke I can borrow? I wanted to tell someone what Mr. Sexton had just told me, but no one would believe me. I mean, they believed that Mr. Sexton told me I could write, but they wouldn't believe that I could be a great writer. They'd look at me with an expressionless face, then say, that's great, May, then get back to discussing what Pamela had said to Trudy about Tim at lunch. I still believe that if you repeat things that matter most to you, it's like letting that bird free in the poem about freeing what you love and having it come back to you. Except I know it won't come back. Do you have a smoke I can borrow? Most kids I knew wanted to get married, maybe become teachers. That was a big dream. One of my friends dreamed about becoming a journalist. But mostly we drank, and if you were me, worried yourself sick about whether or not your friends actually liked you when you weren't thinking about H.P. Lovecraft stories and staring at a crescent moon from inside your room at the ugly, immovable desk your dad had made you, which, in hindsight, was pretty fucking awesome. And it was a total shame that no one in your family appreciated anything your dad, or anyone in your family, for that matter, did or made for each other. Anyway. Bumming that smoke was a total drama queen move. Acting out a part. Or not. Life was... The future was boring. And here was someone offering me a way out. I hurried outside with my smoke to this little area, three brick walls, no windows, and a concrete base beside the school's back entrance. It was ugly, gray, and cold. I watched the dust devils in this little enclave and looked way, way up to the blue sky and clouds. I like to think I was wearing that ridiculous pale blue onesie tracksuit my friends had given me earlier in the year for my birthday. It was ridiculous, that tracksuit, mainly because it was a size too small and I had enormously long arms and legs that I blamed for my clothing woes instead of vice versa. 
I smoked hard, as this is what people did when someone gave them life-changing information. I tried not to think. I tried to think. There was no doubt I would follow this path. I would go to hell and back for this. I couldn't even think of it as an opportunity. I couldn't... Artists, musicians, and writers, demigods. They lived in their own world. People, well, I knew there'd be hell to pay at home if I chose this path, yet people loved artists, musicians, and writers. They didn't have to follow the rules. I could see this golden, sepia-toned cloud I was about to get on or try to get on, even as the cold spring air stopped me, inhaled into my soul. You are about to experience alienation and loneliness like you've never experienced before. You think your life is bad now? Wait till you start this journey. But I was in the journey. No going back. Three. So my grade 12 teacher tells me to write, like not for fun, but a career. The first thing I do is run outside. Okay, the first thing I do is bum a smoke off Terry, one of the bad kids I'm not supposed to talk to, then go outside. I don't smoke. I watch myself, I watch myself bum a smoke. I watch myself run through the smoking area, stop and bum a light for my smoke and run on. The smoking area is sparsely populated. A few kids on spare or skipping classes. I watch myself steer through two pockets of kids, past a couple boys sitting on the edge of the concrete where the smoking area rises up from the parking lot. I watch myself run around the corner and stop in a secluded three-walled alcove beside the back doors to the school. I watch myself watch dust devils and absorb my teacher's words. I dive into myself so I can feel what I'm feeling. Trouble. Something darker and deeper than I can understand. My mother will never let me do this. I know. She will be... I look up at the clouds. I'm a chubby-faced teenager wearing not too much mascara, some god-awful pink lip gloss, and perfume that represents for me the desirableness of a good girl. Loves baby soft. I'm not even that young, 18. Some kids have been on their own for three years now and doing just fine, and some not, but that's another story. I wonder, in hindsight, if my fear of growing up was the reason my breasts had barely started to develop. In spite of or because of my fear, I'm disgustingly intelligent. I know all the answers to all the tests. I read like the big, fat, nerdy loser I am. It is, in every sense of the word, an addiction. I suck at conversation, being such an awk, short for awkward. I have no choice. Mr. Sexton tells me to write, and it's like God opening up the sky and blessing me with light. It's off the charts. I take a long, deep drag on my cigarette. There's a coldness in my ecstasy. It is ecstasy, and not happiness or joy. It grabs me and takes me somewhere that completely terrifies me. I finish my smoke, watch another dust devil, and shiver. It's spring. I have no coat.